Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Simone Tripoli. I am the head coordinator of the Archaeology Brown Bag Series with the Anthropology Department here at UW-Madison. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for coming to our co-organized event uh, with the Center for Southeast Asia Friday Lecture Series. Um, first things first, I want to note that uh, I want to do a land acknowledgement. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejok since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when uh, both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. We acknowledge the circumstances that led to the forced removal of the Ho-Chunk people and honor their legacy of resistance and resilience. This history of colonialization informs our work and visions for a collaborative future. We recognize and respect the inherent, the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation and the other 11 First Nations within the boundaries of the state of Wisconsin. So today, I have uh, uh, the pleasure of introducing Dr. Derek Hang. Uh, Derek Hang is a professor of history at Northern Arizona University and associate senior fellow at the Temasek History Research Center, ISEAS Yusuf Ishak Center in Singapore. Uh, he specializes in the transregional history of maritime Southeast Asia and the South China Sea during the first and early second millennium AD, utilizing archaeological and textual data, data to advance our understanding of this important historical interaction. He is the author of Sino-Malay Trade and Diplomacy in the 10th through the 14th century and co-author of 700 Years, A History of Singapore. He has also authored a number of journal articles and book chapters on the Chinese material remains recovered from archaeological sites in Southeast Asia, particularly ceramics and coins, and has edited three volumes of the history and historiography of Singapore's past. He is currently working on methods in integrating archaeological data from Southeast Asia with Chinese digital textual database. Let's give a warm welcome and a round of applause for Dr. Derek Hang. So thank you so much for um, this opportunity to be here. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to, uh, I think, visit another campus. And I was just telling Nam a couple of minutes earlier, it's becoming increasingly rare to be at a Center for Southeast Asian Studies uh, and also uh, to be able to share research with uh, colleagues in other departments like anthropology. So I uh, have been trained as a historian, obviously, but utilizing archaeological data as part of the source material that uh, I have to rely on for the research uh, on Southeast Asia and its economic interactions with, uh, particularly with China across the South China Sea uh, in the late first and, sec and early second millennium uh, AD. And obviously for that period, in terms of Southeast Asia, uh, there is a need to rely on material cultural remains as a body of uh, data for what we, what we do and how we look at these things. Um, so, Today's topic, which is, you know, and, and of course, the, the mention of the brown, the brown bag, you know, sort of conjures up images of people eating sandwiches, right, mm -hmm. uh, in between classes. So it was really sort of meant to be somewhat um, informal, uh, but really just to look at a couple of issues that pertain to the diversity in a port city or port settlement in the Malacca Straits region, round about the 14th century, just, just before European uh, incursion. So, so uh, 14th century and um, Singapore being the primary focus partly because the last 10 years in tandem with you know, other projects that I've been working on, been really sort of working on this case study of Singapore for quite a while already and I think we're at a juncture where we can actually put out uh, something like a monograph uh, to talk about uh, this port settlement that came up at the end of the 13th century and sort of lasted only about 100 years before uh, the Sultanate of Malacca and everything else you know, sort of happened in this part of Southeast Asia. So um, just as a preamble, you know, pre-modern Southeast Asia is interesting obviously because it's a confluence, right, uh, of the Indian Ocean, the South China Sea, uh, and the Java Sea with a substantial amount of shipping networks that traverse this region, you know, over at least the last two to three thousand years. We've got all these different sort of historical and even contemporary networks of shipping, people, commercial networks, uh, mm -hmm. states with large economies like China, for example, the kingdoms of the Indian subcontinent and so on and so forth, as well as regional powers or regional states uh, in Southeast Asia, all sort of engaging in economic, social, cultural uh, exchanges uh, with maritime Southeast Asia 
uh, and particularly the Malacca Straits region obviously being the sort of conduit uh, through which a lot of these sorts of exchanges uh, were sort of occurring. Um, and along with that, obviously, is the similitude of the natural environment. The coastal areas of Southeast Asia sort of banded roughly by 10 degrees south of the equator to 10 degrees north of the equator. So roughly about this area here uh, shares a substantial amount of uh, natural environmental similarities. Coastlines are quite the same. And so throughout history, because of this substantial amount of interaction, there's always been quite a lot of um, settlements along the coastal region, small little port settlements that would emerge, uh, very often uh, including not just land-based people uh, along the coastline and the riparian environment, but also the sea-based people, including, for example, the Orang Laut, the, the Samabaja, and so on and so forth, people that lived on the sea and on, you know, sort of navigational uh, uh, equipment or, or vessels or boats. And so large numbers of settlements throughout history, uh, especially in the Malacca Straits region, uh, and the absence of large-scale arable land really sort of resulted in many, many pockets of these sorts of settlements along river mouths and anywhere that could provide anchorage. Uh, and obviously uh, such things as water supply, food, uh, and maybe some natural products uh, and produce that could be produced in the sort of localized areas of all these different ports, uh, port settlements uh, over a substantial amount of time. Okay, uh, those of us who worked in this region know that you know if you keep digging down, chances are you will find something when there's a settlement there. Uh, and the other thing is that they do shift substantially, so the lifespans of some of these settlements are not very very long. Typically anywhere from about one to 200 years is the, the most that they would be. There are some exceptions to those rules. South Kedah, for example, is one, and I put it at the ninth century, but you know, as more research is being done, that date is being pushed back further and further into the early first millennium AD. And the reason for that exception to the norm really is because that's one of the most natural landfalls as you come across the Bay of Bengal, right? So throughout history, that has been a geographical area that ships would sort of you know, first land uh, in terms of landfall. And so South Kedah has a much longer uh, settlement, habitation settlement sort of you know, history uh, than most other ports uh, settlements in this region. Most of them really typically last only about 100, 200 years depending on what the networks look like, uh, the shipping lines and so on and so forth and even the geopolitics. But because of the absence of a large-scale arable land environment, uh, many of these settlements are really quite small, uh, highly dependent on the international you know, sort of demography that moves around here. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, do over time be in develop fairly cosmopolitan characteristics that are not just indigenous, but also exhibiting sort of adaptation and assimilation of foreign influ influences and practices. Very often, uh, not necessarily uh, very obvious, uh, but if we look at the data, we can actually find some of these sort of, you know, can elucidate some of these characteristics of cosmopolitanism uh, and diversity uh, uh, sort of emerging out of the information that, that, presents, that is presented to us, both textually uh, as well as archeologically. So Tomasic really only has lasted for about just over one century. From the late 13th century through to the early 15th century. Uh, it's interesting because uh, it's not just a port settlement, but it's also a port polity. It was autonomous. Uh, according to the Sajara Melayu, uh, the indigenous sort of native sort of oral tradition and text that was codified in 1612. Um, talks about um, a series of five rulers that, sort of, that, that ruled this place through the course of the 14th century, just before uh, Malacca was founded at the beginning of the 15th century. Um, the population was probably around about 2,000 inhabitants at the very, mo at the, at, at the very most, uh, but was quite diverse, both from the textual data uh, as well as the archaeology. We'll talk a little bit of the about the archaeology and how it sort of illustrates that diversity uh, you know, later on in, in this uh, sort of informal talk that I'm giving. But also at the same time, it had interesting things I built for, right? A more permanent-based 
uh, a permanent type build form, uh, brick platforms, for example, stone bases that were utilized for the, the construction of the basis of uh, religious buildings, uh, and fairly large earthworks, uh, which marks it out as being quite unique in this landscape of settlement, uh, uh, port settlements uh, in, in, in this region. Most of the settlements in this region, you cannot really actually find any physical remains apart from small finds like ceramics and coins and those sorts of things. Um, usually those are the only kinds of materials that you would excavate. Uh, but uh, in the case of the Masik, there were some sort of um, you know, architectural remains uh, that um, Unfortunately, we don't have any more that we can excavate, uh, but the colonial accounts provide some description of what they were uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, and so we've had to rely on some of that in order to sort of postulate what some of these characteristics uh, would be like. And of course, there was, along with that, some agricultural activity, although it's really, really very small scale, because the size of the arable land was quite, quite limited. Um, so the sources of information for, for Singapore in the 14th century, all otherwise known as Tamasic or Singapura, um, are, are quite substantial, right? Uh, so it's not just the archaeology that we have. Uh, along with the archaeology, and for some of us who work on Southeast Asian uh, settlement sites, we, we usually run into a problem where uh, the archaeological data, or the physical data, really is by and large the the biggest body of material that we, we have right, for the case studies that we're looking at. Uh, in the case of Singapore in the 14th century, fortuitously, we also have a fairly large body of textual material as well. And so that has helped to sort of fill in substantial amount of gaps that we otherwise would not be able to uh, fill, right, just based on the archaeological data. So contemporaneous text, for example, where you have, as I mentioned, the Sajara Malay or the Malay Annals, uh, or the Tufa al Nafis, as it's known uh, in Malay, uh, the Nagara Ketagama, uh, which is a Javanese text from the 14th century, uh, but it was composed in the court of Majapahit at that time in the 14th century in East Java, uh, would be another source of information that does mention about the Masik and some of its characteristics. Uh, two centuries down the road, al although already beginning to be sort of, you know, composed orally, but sort of codified around 1600 AD uh, is another text known as the Pararaton from, from Java. And then along with that, some bits of references in the Vietnamese annals uh, as well. Uh, Chinese materials provide the next body of information and very, very substantial and really contemporaneous. So everything from the Tao Yitzhi, for example, the Da Binan Hai Zhi, all of these are Mongol, Yuan Mongol Chinese texts right, from the 14th century period. Uh, so as the Yuan, Yuan Dian Zhang, which is basically the, it's a record of all the memorials and edicts that were issued by the Yuan court uh, in the course of its existence right, in China, so through the late 13th and early uh, 14th centuries. And interestingly, even very early European accounts as well, like the Sumar Oriental, when the Portuguese first showed up uh, in Southeast Asia, the earliest places that they visited obviously was the Malaccan Straits, right? And so some mention of that about the historical legacy, for example, of the Malacca Sultanate, you know, gets mentioned. Uh, and it does contain some of the information that we can utilize for the case of Singapore in the 14th century. Um, and then obviously the settlement kind of comes to an end at the beginning of the 15th century. Uh, but because the land, the physical landscape remains relatively unchanged until the beginning of the 19th century when the, when the East India Company, English East India Company show up in, in Singapore and establish a port city there. Um, some of the first 10 years in terms of the documentation that we have from the East India Company actually provide very interesting information about the pre-modern period uh, of Singapore. So maps, for example, that date all the way to 1826 have interesting features on them that were from this period of time, not done by the British and not done by the indigenous population, not you know constructed by the indigenous population after the 15th and 16th century. So uh, the maps are one source. Uh, Straight settlement records would be another one with some mentions of you know some features and biographies. So that's the corpus of the textual or documented data that we have. <coughs>
And then along with that, since 1984, uh, some of you may know the name, uh, Dr. John Mixick had started excavating uh, in Singapore since 1984. And since then, for you know, the last three and a half, four decades, we've had like two or three different archeolo archeological units operating in Singapore. Uh, and so archeological data has become one of the most important bodies of information for us. Uh, in Singapore for our understanding and you know, sort of pushing the frontiers of knowledge uh, on Singapore uh, in the 14th century. So I just needed to show you the scale that we're talking about. So Singapore, as you know, is a really small place, right? So this is sort of pretty much where we're looking at uh, in terms of the port settlement of port quality of Tomasic. Uh, and if you zoom in, anybody been to Singapore? Yeah, okay, so it's a, it's, firstly, it's downtown, okay? And then, of course, the scale of the settlement is like super small, right, okay? So you have to imagine something around about 54 hectares, including this strip of land here, um, you know, is roughly the occupation site for this, uh, roughly about between 1,500, 2,000 inhabitants, possibly as a postulated uh, population uh, base. Uh, there is a hill, so there's a high elevation there here. Not terribly high, but just it's still a hill. And obviously, this is a plain, relatively flat land. The former coastline used to be here. These are all reclaimed land. Okay, so this is like really intense urban environment right today. Okay, um, since 1984, in terms of land settlement site excavations, uh, there have been at least about 14 to 15 of them. The number keeps going up every year because there's always redevelopment in this downtown area. And every time there's redevelopment these days, the archaeology units are allowed to go in for about a month uh, to basically conduct some kind of an archaeological survey, right? a, 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 a preservation survey. Uh, and if the site actually looks relatively intact, um, then work stops for about six weeks, only six weeks, uh, and excavation is allowed to take place. Uh, and the, it can be really huge. So one of the biggest challenges for, this is the earliest excavation on the hill uh, that uh, Dr. John Mixick conducted. Uh, I was an undergraduate student at that time, so you can imagine how long ago that was. Um, but um, this site is, is relatively okay because it's in that hill area and that's a designated park. And so there's no development going on. So that's the reason why they were able to over time build that superstructure over it, protect it from the elements. And then it's really taking its time, right? Sort of the 30 year excavation. So this, this is unusual for an excavation in Singapore for the Tomasic period. This is actually what it, what it really looks like on a typical excavation. So a 50, 60th anniversary of uh, 50th anniversary of Singapore's independence was designated as a heritage year. In order to preserve the heritage, the government decided that they would preserve these trees here, the four trees here, that were designated as heritage trees. So the road just behind this area was supposed to be widened by another two more lanes. So what do they do? They came up with a grand plan. It was really pretty amazing. Uh, to dig up these four trees and move them about 50 feet backwards so that they could be replanted in this zone. The only problem with that, obviously, is this is the 14th century settlement site, right? And so in order to save the 100-year-old trees, you're going to destroy the 700-year-old uh, urban settlement sites. And so we get a two-month battle, literally, with the ministry of uh, the Ministry of National Development, like, we have to go and get this place excavated. So finally, the archaeology team that, uh, that I was responsible for uh, in the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, the ICS Yusuf Keshat Center as an archaeology unit, uh, was given permission to excavate this site in one month. So this is, a, I don't know about you, but this is a humongous um, site and so we have to do and this is all the time this is what happens in Singapore for all these sites for the last sort of 35 years and that's rescue excavations basically right so we're going in at about three 
to five centimeter layers going downwards to as deep as about 3.5 meters. Uh, and as you can see, it's fairly dangerous because of the amount of soil retention that needs to be uh, taken care of before the walls cave in. Uh, and so because of the nature of the site, we can't have volunteers. Everybody that was there was professionally paid. So it's a really expensive excavation, this one, that took place in 2015, uh, right? This is an aerial view of the site, and this is what's happening, right? So as, as an excavation, so this is the last phase, okay? So this was the last week of the excavation, and this is the only site that was left that was excavated. It began on this side. And so you would excavate this part really quickly and then move on to the next sector and then move on to the next sector. As we're doing that, they are basically pouring in concrete for the new um, drainage system for the trees. And then on top of that would be a concrete pad. And then finally, they would put the soil in and then they would plant the tree, okay? So it started here and it's moving this way, but this is basically, a, it's an interesting picture because it shows you the process of urban archaeology in Singapore. So as you can imagine, the amount of material is really, like really a lot. Uh, just from the 14th century uh, site itself, uh, we're looking at about nine tons of material, small finds, right? So ceramics, organic material, earthenware, you know, coins, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, about nine tons from the, from, from the Tomasic period, which is late 13th to early 15th century. Uh, and then obviously there is a two, three hundred year layer which is sparsely populated, but there were some people still there, okay, residue population after the late 15th century. And then when the colonial period begins, again, that's another body of material that, that is, is, is there. Uh, between 1984, 85 to about, I think about 2001, uh, the main goal of the archeology span excavations in downtown Singapore was always the 14th century site. Uh, there was the impression that the colonial accounts would provide you with enough information of the colonial period, and so therefore colonial archaeology, uh, colonial period archaeology was not something that we needed to bother with. We just went straight down, hit the layer that's 14th century, has a particular kind of like geological look, uh, and then that's where we would start our work. Uh, more recently, in the last five to 10 years, we decided that actually it's gonna be important for us to begin to f record and find out you know, about the colonial period as well. And so that's uh, increased the amount of work uh, in the excavation uh, as, as a result of that. But, but that's land-based excavations on the Tomasic period, right? Uh, it's a riparian environment, so the river is just next to that site, for example. Um, and so as you go down, you're, you're constantly dealing with water that's coming in, right, from the sea. Uh, and so here the team uh, found an interesting built structure that's made of wood, but because it's waterlogged, the, the wood has actually been preserved. Uh, we don't know what it's for, we don't know what it is, and so the, the wood's now been preserved and you know, awaiting lab analysis. Um, so that's what they're working on uh, there uh, right now. Um, and so we've always thought about Tomasic as a land archaeology kind of place, right? It's a, it's a land-based settlement, obviously it's a port city. Uh, Ships are involved, but, but Singapore being quite a small place has had a limited amount of um, sea upon which we can actually do archaeological research until 2015. And so in 2015, a barge that was on its way from Singapore up to up the South China Sea into the Gulf of Siam actually ran aground on Pedro Branca. Uh, and so in the process of trying to get the the crane away from the lighthouse so that it would smash into this lighthouse that was built in 1830, in the 1830s. Um, and as the divers, the salvage divers went down onto the seabed to clear as much of the debris as they possibly could, because a huge amount of metal, uh, they found two shipwrecks. And so one stated the late 18th century, uh, which is the Shah Munsha, and that's very well documented in you know, British uh, uh, British India accounts, and so that was known, uh, but this is the first time that the, the wreck was discovered uh, in situ and then excavated. That's a cannon. These are all cannons that were retrieved from the seabed. But there was a second wreck that nobody obviously knew about, which was a 14th century wreck uh, 
And so the team spent the last five years, finally for the first time in Singapore history, we could actually engage in marine archaeology. Uh, we used to try to do that with the Thais, you know, the Ministry of Fine Arts, uh, through some success, and now we've got our own wreck, okay, <laughs> uh, from the 14th century. So uh, here's uh, Mikey, one of our, our guys, uh, diving in there. Uh, the season is super short, only two weeks long every year because of the nature of the sea and the currents are quite strong there. Uh, it is really quite deep, about 50 to 80 meters. So at times it's completely dark, you can't see a single thing because of the amount of sediment that's in the sea. Uh, this is a really good day. Uh, and each dive, because of the depth, you can only go down for about 10 minutes. So you can imagine the amount of work that needs to be done within 10 minutes. So the reason why it took five years uh, was because of that. So huge amounts of um, long trench saladin, so easily takeable to the 14th century, so contemporaneous to the Masic period. So for the first time, we actually have some kind of an evidence, really very preliminary at this juncture because the, the, the excavation has just been wrapped up and a preliminary report has just been published. Uh, so it's gonna be years of uh, kind of post-excavation research and, and you know, documentation we need to do. Uh, but they're all from the 14th century very similar to some of the ceramic, to many of the ceramics that were excavated in Singapore in the last 35 years. Uh, but importantly, this is the first wreck that's dated to the 14th century in Southeast Asia that contains a substantial cargo of blue and white ceramics from Xin Tejo. So these are one of the, these are the earliest blue and white ceramics that were produced in South China uh, in large scale during the Mongol period. And this wreck has about um, 400, I think it's like 400 kilograms of shirts. So the total amount of, uh, of uh, shirts that were excavated from that wreck site was about four tons, uh, of which around 400 kilograms of them were blue and white. Uh, and four tons on, on, on that ship is actually a, a very s small proportion of what would have been the cargo. Uh, the cargo would have been substantially much, much larger than that. In terms of carrying tonnage, it would have been about three to 400 tons. And so, you know, most of the cargo is kind of gone, really. Uh, whatever was, uh, was excavated was about four tons of which 3% of the cargo was blue and white. Uh, ex really lovely and exquisite and very expensive items. Most of which uh, were intended for Southeast Asia, although some of it would have ended up in the Middle East eventually. Okay, um, So that's just sort of a, in a nutshell the, the kinds of excavations that, that, that have been going on in Singapore for the last sort of three and a half decades. Really just almost completely focusing on what is effectively this 100 year period right in this, exca in, in this settlement site. Um, there's a lot that one could possibly talk about I think for this, this settlement, but I, I'd like to just sort of confine our sort of the remaining sort of 20, 25 minutes to a, a much smaller Sec segment of it, which is the diversity uh, and the cosmopolitanism uh, exhibited in Singapore through right, the text and the archaeological data. So the trade, the culinary consumption and practices that we can see being one, the nature of the built form and the earthen, uh, earth, earthworks or the earth, uh, earth wall uh, rampart that was, uh, that was uh, uh, constructed uh, by the settlement, uh, the cultural articulation, the expressions as well, uh, include, including language uh, and, and, and uh, jewelry, uh, and also finally the spatial differentiation within a really small settlement site. Uh, we can actually see some vestiges of the spatial differentiation in terms of topography and settlement patterns. Um, so in terms of the material culture, the two real sort of large uh, cultural spheres from which uh, the settlement of Tomasic, you know, got its material cultural sort of you know, vestiges. So one is West Java, the West Java Sea region, uh, the other one is Southeast China. Um, Southeast China obviously because of the nature of the trade, uh, but West Java because that's the immediate proximity, right, sort of the larger region within which Tomasic sort of, you know, was located. Uh, the textual material tells a lot about the, the, the textiles that were brought into this place as well as the metals. Uh, including iron, cauldrons, and bars, but archaeology really is the largest group of materials that we have to work with uh, in this regard in terms of material culture and their consumption patterns, and ceramics would be the largest uh, body 
of material that we can find just because of the natural environment that, that um, this settlement was located in. And to some extent, it's reflective of the, the culinary practices and consumption patterns that we see. So other way is one group of the ceramics that we find. Um, and this is just a picture that we, we utilized for one of the books that was published a couple of years ago. And all these ceramics, including these ones with these patterns that look like textile patterns, you know, kind of cross-stitched uh, textile patterns, all come from the immediate vicinity, which is West Java, the West Java Sea region. Um, this one was included because the photographer thought it looked really nice, but it's good that he's included this because the vast majority come from the Java Sea region except for this one piece. So there's a small proportion that in fact came from Sri Lanka. So it's really interesting that, you know, in terms of the earthenware trade, whatever it is, whether it's just the pot itself uh, or whatever might be contained in them, uh, most of it was from the immediate region. Uh, here, uh, these are the locations that have been identified based on XRF um, tests in the labs about 20, 25 years ago. Uh, and they've sort of, you know, cross-referenced that with some of the materials that have been excavated up in the northern part of uh, Sumatra, the Riau Archipelago, including Singapore, down here in Palembang, which is in southwest Sumatra, and then over on this, this part of uh, Borneo as well. And so we've been able to sort of cross-reference these ceramics. They all look the same, but then in terms of the chemical, you know, sort of elemental composition of the clay, this is, these are the four major uh, areas, which suggests obviously to a certain extent that at least with the immediate region, there was a substantial amount of trade, not just in the ceramics or the earthenware itself, but whatever was carried right in the earthenware on vessels as they were sort of crossing these small little bodies of water uh, and engaging in trade. The second body of material in terms of ceramics were the fine ceramics, and of course, in any Southeast Asian site, including in Singapore in the 14th century, the Chinese ceramics were the ones that really sort of stand out, really. They are the second largest uh, body of material, at least for Singapore. Um, blue and white from Jindezheng, which is here. And so, uh, you know, for a long time, was pretty much sort of Southeast Asian sites and the fights in blue and white, and then the Chinese material right over on the Chinese side where they have huge amounts of excavations and lots of reports. And then now is the first time we are able to link it at the sea, which is the shipwreck excavation that we just completed you know, over the last five years. So uh, a substantial link that not only included blue and white ceramics in the 14th century, but other things including, for example, Qingbai or Yinqing, where you know, the white glaze, you know, with a kind of bluish or greenish hue, uh, porcelain material in terms of the clay body, uh, with a transparent glaze, but under glaze copper oxide, which those of us who work on the northern Philippines in the Luzon area in the 14th century probably will find that very, very familiar. This belimbing or kind of star fruit uh, shape, little jarlets uh, that are decorated with copper oxide under glaze. Uh, very rare, not really found in China, primarily found in Southeast Asia, not in the mainland but actually down in island Southeast Asia. So the Philippines is one, Northern Philippines is one location where there's a lot of these excavated in the 14th century. Singapore is the other place where a lot of these are excavated. So it's really select, right? So the whole point about all of this, including things like the Erhuaware and the Longquan ceramics, for example, is that the demand for the fine ceramics from China is actually quite specific. Uh, it's not just anything that would come by and we will buy it, right? The demand that is being maintained by this port settlement is actually pretty specific in terms of the kinds, right? The, the kinds of ceramics that they would want to import uh, and utilize locally, right, from, from China. So um, that actually is quite different from some other uh, excavation sites. So Tioman is another, Tioman Island of Malaysia. Is another one of those navigational stops that you know have been around for more than a millennia. Uh, and if you look at the excavations that are that have been done in Tioman Island, they mirror exactly the kind of ex, you know production in China, like the broad range of production of ceramics. So as a ship arrives in Tioman, it's taking up stock. There might be things that are broken, you know, or, or they would trade with the locals. And that sort of has a really lovely picture of the broad ex, uh, you know production. Uh, activities in China in terms of fine ceramics. In Singapore, it's not like that. It's very, very specific. 
Uh, the specificity of the demand from China does not end with just the fine ceramics, but also the coarse stoneware, which are primarily storage jars. So these are the main areas that um, the coarse stoneware ceramic shirts that are excavated in Singapore uh, originate from, okay? And so these items, apart from this one here, everything else is basically a container, okay? So it's not so much the ceramic that is the main object of import by the Masik from China, from these three places around the immediate hinterlands of Chenzhou, Guangzhou, as well as in the Zhejiang area, right down on this side. Uh, it's actually the items that are contained in, this, in, in, in these ceramics. So uh, things that include, for example, this. So high density, fairly hard and impervious uh, stoneware jars from Guangdong, which primarily contain foodstuffs that have fairly high density, unit densities. So things like you know your salted fish, for example, maybe pickled vegetables, anything that has a higher liquid content, right? So, and so therefore the density is a little higher. You need it to be somewhat uh, impervious to li liquid penetration, okay? And so these Guangdong jars are utilized for that. This is a picture from the Belitong wreck that's dated to the ninth century, and you have star eddies in there. Uh, and so you have basically what we call food ingredients. Right, that were manufactured in the immediate agricultural hinterland of the port city of Guangzhou in the 14th century, exported to Singapore in fairly large quantities. Um, the other types of uh, stoneware shirts are what we call these brittle or sugary textured ones, uh, very thinly potted uh, and relatively large. We reconstructed one, which is about this size, and so you can put a lot of things in there, but they cannot be very heavy because the moment you lift these jars up because of the, the, the thinness of the body and how brittle they are, the porosity of the stone, stone where they will break apart. So these are, I think, probably more sort of dry goods that we're looking at here, right? Uh, in terms of these, uh, these ceramics and what they, they contain as they were brought in from China. And then these little, small, little beer bottles um, that are called um, small mouth jars now. We're sort of slowly changing the lexicon. They used to be called mercury jars uh, because there was a scholar in the 1970s who thought that the thickness of the base of these jars probably allowed them to, to carry mercury, which has a very high density. Uh, but um, these jars have now been identified to be produced in a very specific area uh, in, uh, in the Chenzhou area. Uh, which is called Cizao, they have very specific volume, uh, volumetric sort of, you know, con the, the, the volume that they can contain is very, very standard. So it's kind of like a beer bottle, 600 ml, you know, kind of one pint. Um, and these areas uh, were known, in, in South Fujian, were known for the production of some of the best um, goodness rice. And so that's for the production of rice wine. So Shaoxing rice wine, for example. So. Um, Lots and lots of these jars were excavated in Singapore, just to give you a sense of the proportion there. So this is the pre-Islamic phase, so drinking was okay. Um, and so huge amounts of these alcohol were, were imported specifically right from, from, from the, the Chenzhou area uh, into uh, Singapore. But the, the main thing that I like to sort of impress upon, upon us is really the impact that that both the Chinese cooking ingredients, the food ingredients, as well as the cooking equipment had on the, the culinary culture in this particular settlement. This is not just a pot that you would utilize for stews and boiling, uh, but with the importation of iron cauldrons per the te Chinese textual documents from the 13th and 14th century, talking specifically about the export of Chinese woks to Singapore in the 14th century allows you to do certain kinds of culinary techniques that you would not be able to do with earthen wet, right? Including things like stir frying, deep frying, uh, and so on and so forth. So that does affect the nature of your culinary practices. So that's one. Second thing, obviously, things including such uh, containers that would, they're like basins that with etched, with etched marks on them that allow you to do certain kinds of mincing and preparation. So along with the food ingredients that were imported from South China in large quantities over the period of this settlement, you know, you basically have a culinary practice that 
has a substantial adaptation of the Chinese ingredients and the practice uh, and you know, techniques uh, from South China as well as from the immediate re uh, you know, vicinity of the West Java Sea region. So um, the food is one example that we can sort of pick out, I think, from the archaeological data that sort of allows us to have a sense right, of the diversity uh, the, and, and cosmopolitanism, we want to put it that way, right, of the uh, material co cultural consumption, at least in terms of food and culinary practices, right? Primarily from West Java as well as the South China and Southeast China. But that is not the only kind of external influences that we see in Tomasic during this period of time. Uh, the built forms seem to suggest that other sources of influence was coming into this settlement uh, as well. So in 1820, about less than a year after the, the East India Company set up a factory in Singapore, a uh, guy by the name of John Crawford, uh, who was on his way from India to the Thai court uh, as an embassy of the British Crown, uh, stopped by in Singapore, and walked around you know, the new settlement uh, and gave a an account of what he saw. Uh, archaeologically, there are some things that we're primarily interested in because we don't have any of those remains anymore. And so his account is probably one of the few ones that we have apart from you know, a couple of maps uh, and the straight settlement entries of you know, the minutes of what they discuss as, you know, as a committee that was running this place. And he mentions a few things. One was an earth rampart in a moat uh, in, near the Singapore River. Uh, the second one was the existence of building bases that were constructed of big brick on the north and the east slopes of Fort Canning Hill. And the third one was a main temple base, a much larger and impressive one uh, on the top of the summit of uh, Fort Canning Hill that was constructed of um, cut sandstone. So uh, that account is pretty important because it's quite detailed. Uh, and it used to be that that was the only account until about 30 years ago, found, uh, John, John Mixick found this map uh, in the British Library archives that's dated to uh, 1825, uh, which was really, really spectacular for us uh, because it showed a earth rampart here that goes from the shoreline through the plain and then it goes around the hill and it's called the Old Lines of Singapore, right? So there was an earth rampart and uh, John Crawford's account tells us that the base of this rampart was about 16 feet wide by about 9 feet high. So it was a fairly substantial earthworks project. It's roughly about a mile long. So this is not a small wall, okay? It's pretty, pretty substantive. Um, in 2019, when um, Professor Kim was at uh, Penn State, we were at the conference and you had a very interesting uh, formula calculating the amount of man hours that would be required to construct one of these things. And, and that, I actually utilized that to calculate um, the, the amount of man, man hours that would be required to construct this wall. It's pretty substantial. Can be done with about 2,000 people, but you know, it requires a certain amount of time and commitment. So uh, this is a pretty substantial construction. You don't see that very often in, in port settlements uh, in this region. Uh, but the other thing that is interesting, of course, is this, this water body here, which is a freshwater river uh, and anybody who knows coastal topo topography will know that that should not be a freshwater river if it was a natural stream. It would be brackish water. And so that's an artificial construct. Probably the earth that was in there was taken out to construct this wall rampart. And then here we have a construction of this moat, right? Which is then sort of them in the front. And even at the beginning of the 19th century, it actually provided fresh water because of the catchment area up there with the hills at a higher elevation. And so you have water supply. So we always thought of this as a defensive feature. But more recently, I think with all the work that's been done on, on, in mainland Southeast Asia on motor sites uh, and retaining earth retaining walls, I think this in fact is two projects that got linked together. One for the retention of soil to prevent erosion or to slow down erosion from the hill, right, which is one. And then the second project really is the construction of the moat where then the earth is just utilized uh, to sort of construct an extended wall. 
uh, because you have to put the earth somewhere, okay? So two very separate uh, constructions. So this is a shout out to you, your project. Uh, and um, you know, uh, wall constructions in settlements are not a new thing in Southeast Asia. It's been around for a really long time, right? So this is a very good example of that. One of the earlier examples in mainland Southeast Asia, but not just up in Vietnam because of the proximity to the Chinese, Right, uh, urban sort of construction culture. But even down in the south in places like central Thailand, for example, in the Varavati sites from in the first millennium AD, where you have uh, you know areas like Yutong and so on and so forth. And these sites are a little different from the ones in Vietnam, I think because they are not just a defensive wall. The earthworks are not just defensive walls. They are meant to be moats. And so water, supply what hydrology is a critical aspect of that right and it continues uh, well into the second uh, early second millennium AD uh, and then on the isthmus of Kra right the northern part of the Malay Peninsula uh, even small uh, settlements on the coast like Kaosam Kyo for example that's been done by uh, the Eco Frances team led by Berenice Bellina uh, uh, finding these earthworks for the purpose of soil retention in what is effectively a fairly, you know, hilly, not hilly but sort of undulating topography. And so to prevent massive soil erosion over time, settlement patterns, settlements there have always been constructing walls. And so what it does seem, and, and I use the word seem because obviously we cannot be definitive about it. Uh, what, what, what it seems is that the, this wall and this is another map that was just found about five years ago uh, in some Scottish Highland manner. Uh, apparently, <laughs> a Scotsman had been there, had a map drawn in 1819, uh, and, and it's like, wow, okay, that's great. We, we actually now have two corroborative pieces of documents, right, separately done over a seven year period that actually shows that the wall and the freshwater stream actually exist. Um, this was the moat that was constructed for the purpose of agricultural activities on this side, okay, uh, of the settlement. Uh, this one more likely reflects that, you know, the, the, the building of earthworks that would be for the purpose of soil retention so that this hill doesn't erode too fast down onto this side. Um, and the reason for soil retention on here in the 14th century was probably not necessarily for agriculture but for building projects. So um, Crawford's account in 1820 talks about the existence of these brick, big brick bases that were strewn all over this area of the hill. Like there were lots of them. Uh, and like the Indus Valley, unfortunately, the moment the British engineers saw that there were bricks freely available in the ground, uh, they took it. Uh, and cannibalized it and built a building there for the governor, okay? So none of those bricks exist anymore, okay? But, but according to Crawford's account in 1820, there were quite a number of these brick foundations uh, on the slopes on this side of the hill, okay? Um, you also then mentioned that there was this one major temple uh, base that was located on this location. And what is interesting about that is that the description of those temp those bases, those brick bases was there is it's not apparent from all the accounts that we have that there was some kind of cosmological arrangement in terms of the layout of these bases. Uh, which suggest suggests therefore that they were organic in nature, you know, like you built one and you build another one, you build another one over time. Um, very similar to South Kada when we think about the temple bases there from the 7th, 8th, ninth century is true even to the 14th century. There is no cosmological logic to the layout itself. Um, very similar to the Varavati sites, for example, in Thailand, where you know you will just have temple bases. I mean, that there's no logic to some kind of cosmology whatsoever, right, at, at a macro level. Uh, even places like Bagan as well, same thing. And so it does seem, at least to me, that there's a possibility that we're looking at a Theravadan or kind of like Gulf of Siam influence, right? For those temple bases that were located over here, 
which, are the, which were built on a communal basis of merit making, a collective communal merit making. But for the one that's located at the top here, right at the top, that really looks special, um, Crawford described that it was about 40 feet on each side from a square base. There was a center, which probably was where the image or the statue uh, of the deity that, that this thing was built for uh, and dedicated to uh, would have been located with, with post holes in these positions. And what is important about this is that this is not a, an architectural characteristic of temple bases in the Gulf of Siam area. Instead, it looks quite similar to things that were constructed in East Java. And so what is interesting is that on the same one location, roughly about the same period, you had two types of architectural built forms being developed. One that was communal, but seemed to sort of, you know, hop to the kind of cultural practices, right, from the Gulf of Siam. And then another one, which was obviously a little more special, but was drawing from the architectural tradition of East Java in the 14th century. And so the question becomes, why is, you know, why is that the case, right? And is Java, basically, does it appear that Java is an important audience for things that were external facing in terms of high cultural articulation, right? Whereas those other temple, those other building bases were really for internal consumption. So in some ways, there is the possibility that we're looking at a culture that had two different sites in terms of its cultural articulation. The internal articulation, which is for themselves, that had to the Gulf of Siam and the Isthmus of Kra. The other one, which is externally facing, harking to uh, East Java and Majapahit in the 14th century. And so this brings us to this whole issue of high culture articulation, right? What was the nature of high, high culture articulation uh, in the Masik or Singapore in the 14th century, who was the primary audience here? And what is really interesting, of course, is this temple base, by the way, from where it's located on the hill, you can actually see it as you're coming along the coastline and looking at the hill, right? So the hill itself, Fort Canning, is a high elevation ground. So from the sea, you can actually see it. And where the temple would have been located, uh, you can actually see it from the sea. In fact, the British built their uh, governor's mansion with the flag mast in, the eight, in 1819 onwards. It was specifically for the purpose that ships coming by can actually see it from the sea. And so this is something that you can see from the outside looking in. Okay? Whereas the other buildings were on the back side of the hill, you could not see it from the sea. So uh, spatially, there is a differentiation. So what is interesting about Singapore in the 14th century is that, uh, that the other kinds of archaeological remains that have been excavated uh, that are really nice come have a very strong East Javanese sort of you know cultural sort of uh, uh, traits to, the, to them so this that figurine for example a Surya which is basically a rider on a winged horse uh, is a Javanese imported item uh, and this was excavated in Singapore but on the hill itself there was a collection of uh, gold items that were that were you know stumbled upon when a toilet was being built up there uh, in 1926, uh, and these are the only three that have remained after the Japanese occupation. The rest disappeared from the museum, um, but it included like a ring with a goose, a hamsa kind of uh, you know iconography, very very reminiscent of East Java Majapahit jewelry art this uh, little gold amulet about this size and obviously you wear it around your wrist uh, which looks extremely similar to this East Javanese piece from the 14th century and so obviously gold being expensive high culture consumption uh, seemed to suggest that Java right was the source from which this sort of cultural sort of you know uh, vestiges were coming from the other thing is writing so there was a 12 foot high stone that was erected here, made of granite, was sheared in half, uh, and in between the two sort of sites that were close facing each other, this big boulder was cut in half, two sites, uh, was a very long inscription uh, that uh, JG uh, de Caspari, uh, when he was alive, had actually looked 
added and said it probably was old Javanese datable to roughly about the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, and so that inscription was located at the entrance of the Singapore River, which is the main anchorage right, of this port uh, settlement. Uh, there is no other indigenous like written language material or of any kind to be found on the, in the settlement, which again suggests that um, you know the external facing sort of cultural articulation seemed to be the main audience would, would have been Majapahit uh, in East Java at this juncture. Uh, there are only three fragments that we know of from 1840 onwards because the British engineers wanted to build uh, a, uh, a cannon uh, artillery station here and so they stuck a couple of dynamites and blew it up. Three pieces were left. Uh, one became a park bench, subsequently ended up in the, um, the, uh, the, the Bombay Museum. Uh, um, the other two pieces lost. So right now we only have one piece left in Singapore, I believe is that one. Uh, and it's like a national treasure now, so the other two <laughs> lost forever. Uh, kind of, it's supposed to be in the, the, the Bombay Museum archive somewhere in the basement. Uh, conjures the image of um, Indiana Jones. <laughs> you know, the last scene of Indiana Jones where they push the Ark of the Covenant into that big warehouse that nobody knows about? Yeah, so, so it's somewhere there, somewhere there, yeah, somewhere there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time, so I'll finish in about three minutes. Um, but I wanted to show this to you because the ceramics actually reveal a second interesting thing. And that is that if you actually do some kind of a quantitative sort of breakdown of them. Uh, the, these are just four of the you know, many sites that we've excavated, but with a large enough body of material uh, that we can sort of try to do some of these. These are all 14th century ceramics, fine ceramics, blue and white, white, greenware. And these are the relative proportions uh, for all of them. And if you put them uh, into some kind of a graph, what you find is that as a whole, in terms of these four sites, you know, firstly, greenware, everybody uses it, right? So it's like the most common thing that you can think of, okay? Um, but for whiteware, these two sites, in terms of the consumption patterns, obviously share really very similar patterns of consumption, all right? Whereas these two are fairly different. And then in terms of blue and white, which is quite exquisite, expensive, uh, and rare, uh, these two sites have almost like negligible amounts of consumption of blue and white. The St. Andrew's site has some, but the Fort Canning site really is consuming quite a lot of the, the blue and white uh, ceramics. And what you can do in terms of thinking about economic and aesthetics is that these two sites obviously are quite distinct from each other. So the whole settlement is consuming greenware, right? But in terms of the other sort of, you know, differentiation characteristics of fine ceramics, this Location here, whoever is living here and here, actually is quite different from each other. Um, but there are some shared similarities between those that settle on the hill and those that are settling near the hill here, at the bottom of the hill. And so this is aesthetics and economic, uh, you know, sort of consumption patterns. If you look at the coarse stoneware ceramics, which would be food stuff, again, you can do the same thing, but it shows a slightly different. Uh, pattern here and that is that in terms of culinary practices this is the kind of connection that we can see in terms of the, the, the subgroups right in terms of where they're located on the settlement so these areas the people who are here probably probably share a substantial amount of culinary practice similarities this is a distinct group and then obviously Fort Canning Hill is a very distinct group mainly because they are drinking lots and lots of Chinese wine okay <laughs> compared to everybody else okay um, and so that information is important because actually in the Sejarah Malayu it does talk about um, these different sort of you know like proximities right social proximities between these different groups in uh, the the polity of the body politic of, of the Masik and the ruler himself right in terms of how close that group is right to the ruler and if you draw out a, a diagram this is actually what it looks like and so this was interesting in 2013 when we did a project on this and we wrote a paper based on the text alone. This was what we came up to as a 
plausible sort of you know outcome, uh, diagrammatic outcome of the body politic and the, the demography, uh, and 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 you know and so on and so forth. And what is interesting is that looking at the archaeology now, we can actually begin to see that being sort of represented too, and actually quite converges very well with this diagram. So we're going to try to do a bit more. Hopefully, we'll be able to build more on that, so that uh, you know we can we can corroborate the archaeological data with the text. And I'll just end with this last slide, uh, and that is that when we think about the geographical areas from which culture has been appropriated and adapted and then assimilated and internalized in Tamasic, which is not a very big settlement. These are all the different geographical areas that uh, the material culture, you know, the cultural and aesthetics and so on and so forth come from. And so it's interesting when we look at what is effectively a really small settlement, uh, it really shows that whole notion, right, of Southeast Asia and the Malacca Straits in particular being the convergence of these major littoral zones, right, the Bay of Bengal, South China Sea, and the Java Sea. So I, I'll, 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 I'll just end on this slide. Thanks so much.